Welcome everybody and thank you for joining us for our Mission Mosquito webinar. We've gone through the welcome. Um, you're in the right place because we're talking mosquitoes. I'd like to introduce to you the Low Mission Mosquito team. I am joined today by Dr. Rusty Lowe. She's the campaign scientist and Liz Burke, the senior science educator and science writer on the team. I'm Cassie Sofing. I'm also a senior science educator and probably joining us, possibly joining us will be uh, Peter Nelson, land cover scientist who works with habitats. And Dorian Janney is off today, but she works with lifelong learners. A little bit of an update on our observations so far. And so far, since we've begun our campaign, we're at 34,257 observations. So big shout out to us because as a team, that's you and everybody else, we're doing a great job with our observations. So please keep, keep sending them in. Okay. What I'd like to introduce today, Dan Killingsworth on the TREAD Mosquito Management Program. And Dan's a graduate of the University of West Florida with degrees in environmental resource management and medical technology. And his main work focuses on developing practical and effective integrated pest management methods in private pest control, public health vector, and agricultural settings. And there's an emphasis on surveillance, identification, biocontrols, and process accountability. He's got a varied background, but as you might have heard at the beginning, he's been a beekeeper for over 25 years. And he'll go into more detail and information, but Dan, I'm gonna turn the slide sharing over to you. So thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me, this is a real pleasure. Uh, so uh, my name is Dan Killensworth. I'm the Director of Operations for Environmental Security Pest Control. Uh, our main office is in Pensacola, Florida. Uh, we operate from Mobile, Alabama to Panama City. Uh, today we're gonna go over uh, a, a mosquito management initiative that I I'm getting off the ground here for tire management, so it's container mosquito related, and how the mosquito habitat mapper is going to be instrumental in uh, pro prolong, uh, progressing that project. So much to cover today. Uh, we're going to review basic mosquito issues, limits of treatments, environmental impacts of treatment methods, uh, a good bit on mosquito ecology, some innovative alternatives. That may be presumptive to call it innovative, but certainly uh, I, I'll, I'll, I will. Uh, and biocontrols, uh, and as well as uh, some cooperative surveillance strategies, which really is what uh, the mosquito habitat mapper is all about. So, mosquitoes and people, uh, we, we all recognize the conflict and the challenges we uh, mosquitoes present uh, to, to, to our quality of life and health. And so the question continually asked, I think, through time is, you know, what, what value do mosquitoes have in our world? And I think a more modern question, given our tools and technologies and our abilities, is what if we were to try to get rid of all our mosquitoes? Well, I think the experiment's been done, and mosquitoes are ahead of us. And so we've been un unable to eliminate even one species of mosquito that we're aware of. Um, could this outcome be different? Or should it be different? You know, it's difficult to calculate uh, the impacts of removing an organism from the ecological web. Um, and we have made tremendous gains in increasing um, our, our disease management capabilities and, and reducing those impacts on human life and for nuisance populations. Um, so look, I'd like to reflect a little bit on how we evaluate uh, our mosquito methods and our, mo our motivations. So challenges with mosquito control. So if we look at the mosquito, you know, they're quite frail. Uh, they generally aren't strong flyers and they require blood feeding for egg production. So, you know, that's a dangerous way to make a living. And, you know, quite often, I mean, how many mosquitoes have we swatted in our lives, you know? A difficult way to, to go about things. But so we can consider why are they so successful? Well, they are a diverse family. Uh, they, they fill many ecological niches. Uh, now, part of that is, you know, they have a complete life cycle. So like beetles and hymenopteran, to include the ants, bees, and wasps, 
dipterans, flies, uh, are also have that complete life cycle where the immature stages don't overlap the adult stages and so they're not fighting for resources and that kind of thing and so that that's that's um one of those uh possibilities as to why they're so successful they have excellent sensory perception uh they take advantage of this for the, uh, their blood meal and uh, they have resilient eggs and here's an image here of the 80s albopictus eggs and some 80s triceriatus which is the native tree hole mosquito so you have native and invasive species, they are coinciding in the same setting. Chemical treatments, okay? Uh, you know, chasing the mosquito man, we've all seen this image before, but over the decades, uh, our treatment methods have advanced. Our chemical modes of action have become less harmful in the environment over time. Uh, and that's good, that's good. And the global trend toward um, reducing the broad spectrum pesticide use in the environment uh, is, is, will continue, and it should. Uh, Non-target invertebrate protection initiatives are promoting environmental stewardship and temperance from chemical controls, and that, that trend won't, won't stop either. So justifying use of uh, pesticides is becoming more and more challenging. Uh, for example, uh, we have a product called NALID, and so this is what the public health mosquito control efforts use from aerial applications uh, for adult mosquito control. This product was registered in 1959. If we look back, 1959, there were 48 stars on the flag, right? So that, that year, Alaska and Hawaii entered the Union. Elvis was making, a, making an impression on us back in 1959, so new on the scene. So those products back then were very good. And NALID's a very effective product, still being used as a low residual in the environment. But if that's all we're relying on, over time, if we're just using the same product and not trying to be more innovative, then the song gets a little sour. Endangered species uh, have become a major part of the topic for mosquito management. Um, especially along in, invertebrate protections. So those non-target issues, the non-target species that are affected potentially from adult mosquito control. So in 2017, US Fish and Wildlife Services put the Rusty Patch Bumblebee on the Endangered Species Act list. So it's the first invertebrate to be put on that list. And that list is increasing and, and will continue to do so throughout the US. Honeybees and the effects that potentially adult treatments or any level of pesticide treatments can affect honeybees. I've been a beekeeper for 25 plus years, so this is always top of mind, pollinator issues. Um, being a part of the beekeeping community, it's, uh, it's important to recognize that we have our own challenges. We put products in our hives to protect our bees from varroa mites and other pests, but the varroa mites being the top challenge. Uh, and so it's it's, it's a dynamic that has to be uh, weighed out all the time, and beekeepers should be aware of the products they're putting in their hives as well. So a little bit about mosquito diversity. Um, throughout, the U throughout the world, 3,500 plus mosquitoes worldwide, about 350 so or, or so in the United States. Where I live here, 87 in Florida, in my county, I have 55 species in my county. So I have a nice little playground in the backyard to go collect. Uh, the state of Colorado, for example, has 65 mosquitoes, give or take. Um, and they have, obviously are going to have different types of mosquitoes. So, for example, Colorado has meltwater mosquitoes. So that as the snows melt, the rock pools collect water, mosquitoes develop in those. So those are those niches we were talking about that, that get filled at a regular rate by any variety of mosquitoes. And again, mosquitoes are in the order of diptera, so they are true flies. So what are adult mosquitoes feeding on? Well, through molecular techniques, it's possible to determine exactly what a particular species of mosquito is feeding on. And um, that helps 
surveillance efforts that helps control efforts as to what mosquitoes are a challenge to human health or what might be reservoiring uh, a particular uh, pathogen and uh, enable us to target our control methods. So what's on the menu? What do we determine from these things? And all these images are from uh, uh, Dr. Larry Reeves, uh, except for um, the top left that's uh, pulled from a National Geographic image. But as you can see, mosquitoes are feeding on reptiles, amphibians, birds. That one on the, on the far right is a Uranitania feeding on the eyeball of a bullfrog, of all things. And here's an image of Dr. Reeves, who's uh, not only a wonder in the lab, but he's also an avid field uh, experimenter. And so he's, he's collected a great deal of data from the field to a point where he was able, even actually able to discover, make a new discovery here. So in doing his blood meal analysis, this particular mosquito on the right, Uranitania saffirina, they were unable to determine exactly what kind of blood meal that they were feeding on. Uh, so he went out into the field. This is in, in south of Gainesville, into the swamps, got down and dirty, and was able to image and video this Uranitania saffirina feeding on annelids, so worms, like roundworms and, and uh, um, leeches. So that, that's, a, that's invertebrate on invertebrate crime going on right there. And that was, that was unknown at the time. We, we assumed it's always the mosquitoes feeding on vertebrates. And so once he was able to make the molecular uh, shift in the lab, he was able to make this determination. And so this was a, a, quite a discovery. And here's an image uh, that uh, Dr. Reeves put a, a, of Saffirina, and it is a beautiful mosquito. So a little bit of background on me. Uh, I volunteered with the Mosquito Control back uh, in Escambia County, Florida, back in 2000 in University of West Florida. There was an advertisement for uh, volunteering for vector surveillance and species ID. This is when West Nile virus was first on the on the on the rise. So it's important to recognize what mosquito control is doing in the background before you ever see a truck out in the road. This is the work that's getting done. So they they do the surveillance that involves systematically trapping mosquitoes at legacy sites to gauge population levels uh, with the purpose of establishing a baseline for mosquito activity. You know, how, how active are the mosquitoes and at what level? They then perform those trap counts and collate those species, count for nuisance mosquitoes compared to vector mosquitoes. And if it, those vector numbers hit a certain threshold number, they may triage that area for a treatment. Some mosquito control districts use uh, what are called sentinel chicken programs, where they put immunologically naive new chickens, young chickens out into the, into the wild in a cage. When they get fed on, uh, those viruses may be transmitted to the bird. Uh, those birds develop antibodies. And then if those antibodies test positive, the chicken results test positive, then that also may put that area up for a treatment. Human cases will often trigger an area-wide treatment, and the, the health department is usually involved at this point um, for obvious reasons. So. so through my collection efforts, I've been able to fortunately work with some wonderful folks in the public health arena to make a few publications about some of the surveillance work we're doing, and uh, it, this has been a wonderful collaboration. I've, I've gained a great deal from it professionally and I've made quite a few friends. So along the lines of uh, surveillance work, uh, we're looking at creating a process called TRED, the Tire Removal Education Alteration Disposal Initiative. And so we all recognize that, that tires promote mosquito populations. It's, um, to what degree is, is, is a, is a Good question to, to uh, evaluate, but this program is designed, and I'm using the Mosquito Habitat Mapper to help collect the data. How many tires are we seeing in, in, our, in our midst? What type of mosquitoes are involved uh, in the tire um, uh, development? 
and uh, what can we do to help get uh, maybe predict where we're going to find them the, you know the ecological setting where these tires end up and so um, it, this is a this project can be used at different levels if you, there's a PR project for a mosquito control district or it can can get into some hard science if we choose to but I'm looking forward to using the mosquito mapper uh, to help get this off the ground. So a little bit about tires. Um, when we have a problem, it's usually chalked up to people being lazy and they just don't want to throw their tires away or take them to the landfill. But, but it's more than that. You know, tires uh, are persistent. Um, and to landfill them is not necessarily the best answer either. There's technical and logistical hurdles when landfilling tires. They don't degrade uh, at any uh, appreciable rate. Uh, they also, when they're whole tires, they don't bury well because of their elasticity. They tend to work themselves back up to the top, often ripping the, the, the landfill liner, and they continue to be a problem once they reach the top. Uh, if they're below, they often can catch fire, uh, and then there's noxious gases that are emitted uh, there at the landfill as well. Um, recycling them is a, a good use, and, and about 50% of, of tires are, are used for energy production for cement kilns and that kind of thing, but all that's very energy intensive and expensive. Uh, it's, it's not an easy solution. Um, here's an example of trying to landfill tires and recycle them. This is the this is an 8,000 foot view, the, the, the left picture. This is the largest monofill, which is a landfill that collects one type of material. So it's this tire landfill. Um, and so, you know, this, to, what, what do we do with these problems? The, the technology has to catch up to where we can recycle some of this material and, and use it in better ways. But I'm not picking on Colorado. I mean, it doesn't, I don't have to drive far in my own county to run into tire problems and dump problems. And this, the middle picture with the, the large refuse pile has, I counted at least 40 tires in there. And I sampled quite a few mosquitoes from it. So uh, the third picture from the left, uh, this is a new technician we were training. And uh, this, this is a mile from my office. Um, and we were getting quite a bit up here too. Uh, if you'll notice where I've got the arrow pointed, that's um, in doing my survey work, you know, we're, we're trying to collect data as to what we're seeing. And, and so sometimes the best means is just take a picture with my phone and scratch an image on there that I can then go put back in my notes. And again, this is where I think the mosquito habitat mapper is going to be instrumental in, in uh, um, modernizing our, our surveillance methods. So. As I mentioned, we were getting bit up here pretty good, but sometimes this is the survey work you got to do, the down and dirty out in the field. But we could ask the question, why do mosquitoes bite? Um, as most of you probably know, it's only the adult female mosquito that actually bites. Um, this is to gain proteins from the blood for egg production. So protein uh, equals growth and development. Carbohydrates are for energy. And so the male and female mosquitoes both feed on nectar. So like for the honeybee, it, it goes out and forages uh, wildflowers, collects the nectar, brings the nectar back in and creates, it, it dehydrates the water off that nectar to produce honey. That is sim simply for growth, or excuse me, for, for energy. Mm -hmm. But it's the pollen that they collect as well. And they ferment that pollen into what they call bee bread. That's what they use for, for growth and development. So, but in the, that protein is also needed for egg production uh, and that process is called vitellogenesis. Um, it, ultimately, what we're looking for are what are called fat bodies. And so as the, as the insects develop, insects have what are called fat bodies, which kind of act like a liver and fat tissue as, as used by mammals. And fat bodies are where those nutrients are stored. So it's difficult to be a mosquito. It's a difficult way to make a living. Uh, all mosquitoes require water for egg and immature stage development. 
uh, in the larvae feed on the algae and the bacteria and the detritus in that water column. Uh, but that's a very low nutrient content. So clean water, like you find in your dog bowl, uh, doesn't provide a favorable mosquito habitat. Now that dog bowl that's been sitting two weeks, and been rained in, hasn't been brought in, that, that's more suitable for mosquitoes. And so this is where we have to be mindful of uh, source reduction in the backyard and that kind of thing. Um, so it's difficult for the developing mosquito larvae to acquire proteins needed for growth. So in a way, the way I think of it, is that emerging adult mosquitoes are nutrient deficient. And so this is what lends them to, to, to mis uh, blood feeding. Now, blood feeding obviously by mosquitoes comes in direct conflict with us. And so I'd like to introduce you to a mosquito that has kind of hacked that code and uh, I consider one of the good guys. This particular mosquito, Toxorhynchites. This is a picture from Larry, uh, Larry Reeves as well. This is the largest mosquito in North America. Uh, it is a nectar feeder only. Uh, and you may have been introduced to this one before. So I'm sure most of you have seen Jurassic Park and the premise of the movie, of course, is that the a mosquito trapped in amber, the, they extracted the blood from the mosquito and then from that DNA, supposed dinosaur DNA, they were able to follow along with the storyline. As it turns out, that mosquito used was the Toxorhynchites, which obviously is not a blood feeder. So as it turns out, Ross was right all along. But even better than science fiction, I think the Toxorhynchites uh, is just fascinating. And so it is a mosquito like no other. So the adult tox females seek out uh, other, uh, seek out tree holes and other cryptic containers that support mosquitoes. And she dive bombs her eggs into the, that reservoir, which then develop as predatory larvae of other mosquitoes. So all tox larvae prey on other mosquito larvae. And so adult females and males are nectar feeders only. So it's in the uh, tox larvae, and you can see how robust they are compared to a regular larvae, if you top right corner or top bottom left corner. It's this stage right here where they're develop, they're gaining all the nutrients they need so that when the adult female emerges, she doesn't need a blood meal for egg production. Fascinating. So of toxorhynchides, there's about 90 species worldwide. Within the U.S., there's two species uh, and two subspecies. Uh, so Toxorhynchites rutilis septendrianalysis, septendrianalis, is the majority of the geo-reference dots you see here. Toxorhynchites rutilis rutilis, you're going to find south of Orlando. And then Toxorhynchites moctezuma, this little dot right here. So it, it goes down into Mexico as well. Uh, but it just reaches across the U.S. border, Moctezuma. And you can see here's a nice image from the Walter Reed Biosystematics Unit, uh, a side view of Toxorhynchides and her long proboscis, how it's designed for nectar feeding. And uh, it actually can't even blood feed at this point, but it almost looks like a finch beak there, right? So here's a wonderful blog that uh, Dr. Lowe put together. Uh, 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 a group of us were traipsing around the Sky Islands here in southern Arizona, uh, looking for Toxorhynchides moctezuma uh, with very little success, but we had a great time out in the field. Uh, we're searching tree holes, right? We just use a little turkey baster, find all the tree holes we can, investigate all the, the that little bit of water, and uh, it is a lot of fun out in the field. This is my son here on the left and on the right. And so he had spent a couple days out there with us and it's a wonderful time. So Toxorhynchites, it's feeding on other mosquitoes. Can we use it as a biocontrol? Well, it's devil, so several studies have been done uh, to evaluate tox. Um, those are, I would say those studies have been limited oftentimes because the amount of tox available is limited. Uh, there's some challenges with rearing tox. Um, the shelf life is pretty short for the eggs. And as with any insect rearing, uh, it has a high labor cost. Um, these studies, I, I believe, were limited in scope. 
Um, biocontrol efforts really require a significant number over time, steady pressure in order to generate uh, an, an effective control. Additionally, you have to have a sustainable and repeatable rearing method that anybody can do to, to be successful. But that, that rearing method has been developed. So I'd like to, you to in, uh, introduce you to Anita Schiller. She's the founding program director in Harris County, Texas, Precinct 4, for their biological control initiative. And she developed an art, uh, a supplemental uh, diet for tox to be reared in the lab at scale. And uh, she's done wonderful work. She's been a mentor and a friend and helped me with my tox colony. So she reached out to me when COVID was first coming about and they were uh, losing some funding. They were going to have to lose a tox colony rather than send it to the wild. She offered it to me and uh, I graciously accepted happily. And so this is some of the rearing um, scenes that go on in the lab. So as I said, the tox, she'll dive bomb her eggs into these cups, these ova cups. You let them sit 24 hours, you then pour those eggs out, and you evaluate them either by weight or I, I count them. And then you rear them up on these trays um, with different uh, supporting um, food. So Pangrellus oh. reduvitus. Yes, ma'am. Dan, I've got a question for you. Yes, what yes. Makes those, what makes those egg cups so enticing for the mosquito moms to use? Why do they use the ovi cups? Yes, wonderful. Okay, so in the natural world, uh, a tree hole, you know, a, a little rotting hole where a limb was or, or where the, the, the limbs may come together and the leaf matter collects and over time that rots, right? And so that is a good sink, a good coll a collection point for detritus and that kind of thing. Other mosquitoes use that as a development site. And so Tox um, will then go and dive bomb her eggs into there because there's gonna be a, a resource for her eggs or for her larvae as they develop. Um, awesome. Yep, so in, the, uh, so in the natural world, it, it, you're gonna have water in those cup, in those tree holes. The Aedes, like Aedes aegypti or Albopictus or, or Triceriatus, or, they're gonna lay their egg right above that water line. And so then as the next rain ensues and water enters, the egg will then be submerged and those larvae hatch. So uh, all, all those spots are cryptic, right? I mean, that's part of the challenge where mosquitoes can find places that we're just not going to be able to get product or even you think to try to control. And okay, so, one more one more question, Dan, yeah, because I absolutely. hear people say that this is my question. Yeah, but yeah. you know, um, I remember hearing, you know, even back when I was in Peru, uh, working with Amy Morrison, she was talking about cryptic habitats, and mm -hmm. I don't really have a strong sense of what people mean when they say a cryptic habitat. So could you clarify that also? Sure. For yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So just meaning like out of the way or unknown, you know. So uh, like we say. Let's fall back on my pest control work. I do bed bug work too, right? And so, you know, bed bugs are not hard to kill, right? But they're cryptic in that they're, they, they hide very well. So it's difficult to get at them to, to control them. So in the same way that uh, some of these cryptic development sites, they're kind of out of the way and just inaccessible to us at a real level, you know, so. Thanks. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yep. Uh, so we have another example here of eggs that we're collecting. And so the idea is to collect eggs, count them, know how many hatch off. So you get an idea of how, um, you know, what her fecundity rate is and, you know, to know how many, how much effort you need to go into rearing hawks up at a rate that you want to disperse them. You need to know how many eggs are, are, are viable. We feed them uh, supplemental diets. All mosquito have um, four stages of larval development. Uh, the first larval stage one gets fed these little nematodes, which is in this uh, potato broth, potato medium, and is fed directly into this communal tray. Now, some of these larvae are going to they're going to cannibalize one another to a degree, and that's acceptable. So it's a supplemental way of feeding them as they. Rear up to L2, 
larval stage two, we're going to feed them these little darrow worms, which we find out in, in containers all the time, tree holes all the time. So that's a good supplemental method. And these are, I purchased these from Carolina Scientific and then culture these as well. So this is as much about culturing the, the food medium, the supplemental food medium, as it is the tox themselves. The L late stage, larval stage three and four, get fed the frozen blood worms that you can get at a, a pet shop. And so uh, they eventually pop off as, as pupae right here. And once they get to the pupil stage, almost you know, get almost 100% um, immersion from here. So they're, they're pretty hardy as, as pupae. And here's my son again. So any lab director or parent recognizes this face, right? Uh, but uh, uh, <laughs> Nathan has helped me on several occasions in the lab. Uh, so we'll spend a little time together. Um, and that's always been fun. And so that was part of the treat of going, having him come out to Arizona with me. So he can see not only just what goes on in the lab, but you know how it works in the wild and how the two converge. Uh, and so here, here's a little talks that got out. This is what happens when you, me, uh, forgets to zip up the, the cage, but all is well. So, Poxronchites. This isn't a this isn't a pet colony. This is a production colony with the idea of, of using it as a biocontrol. And so we have to test that. And so let's bring it back to tires, right? We know mosquitoes develop well in tires. And so my thought was, well, let's let's try to create a tire development chamber where I can take some of the larvae and put them out in the field and see how well they do. We can't assume that the larvae from the lab are going to are going to act like the wild top. So we have to we have to test that. So here's an example of a two gallon container that I often find wild talks in. So just to give you a, a reference for scale on the size of the, the tire and the setting that we have in here. A lot of mosquitoes here, a lot of talks. And so I simply just clamshelled this tire. And this is a very simple chip dip tray that I got from Dollar Tree for a for a dollar. Um, white is not the ideal color, but that was available to me at the time. I've since updated this. It's black and the wells are deeper, but um, it was a good initial way of evaluating tox. And so I was putting late stage L3 and L4 into the each of these sectionals and just as well as adding this what is called uh, ov ovistrips. And so this is seed germination paper. It's, got, it's a little bit rough. Mosquitoes like to lay their eggs on that. And uh, so the nuisance and it's a bunch of ADs mosquitoes were laying their eggs on these ovistrips and then the tox were consuming them. So they're, they, you know, it's a test of how well can, will the tox go to adulthood? And, and I check that by counting the pupil exuvia as they, you know, the shedding of the pupa. So I can assume that they're, they came out as adults. And um, they're also feeding supplementally on any mosquito larvae that, that emerge from those eggs. So that was a, yeah, that was a good a initial question. test. Yep. Great, thank you. I have a couple of questions also that relate to um, the, those those of us that actually you know um, do mosquito trapping and you know for education purposes in our classrooms. Mm -hmm. And um, I was just thinking, you know, that you know it, you and I talked about how this chip dip. Uh, thing which is available like at a lot of dollar stores. I had my mom try and find one yesterday because that's her hobby, ah, okay. going to dollar stores. Um, <laughs> right. And she did find one um, that this is a great way to do like a controlled experiment with different kinds of foods or different kinds of turbidity of water or or things Ooh. like that. So um, just keep this in your mind, um, you know, guys, if you are interested in doing this and we're going to um, put some instructions out on how to create traps like this that were designed by Dan. The other question I had about is about the seed germination paper. Uh -huh. um, we, uh, we have used in the past um, uh, found materials, like for instance, the, um, the liners that uh, we use that um, come with a, like a, a, a coffee, you know, a coffee shop cup, sure. like a Starbucks liner. How, yeah. uh, what do you think about using those instead of going to get the seed, the seed germination paper? Right. Um, what is nice about the paper is that it lasts a, a good long time submerged. 
-hmm. So the coffee filter types, um, there, some of them can be slick and those that aren't, they tend to um, degrade pretty quickly. Um, mm -hmm. Any of it can be used. I mean, from, from tongue depressors, that was kind of like the beginnings of uh, overstrips. Uh, any, any number of media could be used. I try to, this is pretty, pretty inexpensive. Mm -hmm. to, to use these and they can go in various size um, uh, cups, obviously. Um, yes, I, I, if you're going to do a level of, of surveillance with anything, I would just suggest standardizing mm -hmm. so that you're using the same medium all the time. Perfect. Thank you. Yep, absolutely. And this tray, you know, so I, as I said, I've modified it a little bit, but it can be used for other types of uh, evaluations in the field for, like, as you said, different uh, selective uh, media in the in the water, uh, as well as even side by side larval development um, assays. You know, given the same conditions, does this species develop quicker than the other side by side or together? That kind of thing. So I think it has a multiple range of purposes, and I'm looking forward to to using it uh, at a greater scale this year. I'm going to start putting out larval stage two talks this year, as well as increase the rate of L3 and L4. So the quicker I can get the L the talks out into the field, theoretically, uh, the less impact it is on the on the lab, um, but also, um, you know, potentially a better control rate in the field. And so, all this is an experiment in in its beginning stages, but I'm having fun with it. To include, you know, I do my have a little fun with the artwork and trying to promote tox and um, there it's a beautiful mosquito as a as an adult and larvae and from these I've made some art that I think has been fun and people like and I've made some t-shirts from these and um, all of it in good fun just to keep keep myself and everybody else interested um, and again so this is about you know can biocontrols work are they effective uh, as a as an avenue of exploration, and so we could we could look at one example in the 80s in southeastern U.S. The 80s Egypti, the yellow fever mosquito, was supplanted, displaced in, in a real way by 80s Albopictus. So Egypti, an invasive mosquito, been here three four hundred years. 80s Albopictus likely brought in through the tire trade. Um, came in and pushed Egypti aside. Now, how did that happen? Often it was thought, initially it was thought maybe larval competition, those tree hole settings that are nutrient deficient, perhaps uh, Albopictus is a better competitor, and that may be a factor. But what's been recently discovered in a publication in 2016, uh, it's a process called satirization. And so it's, um, uh, it's a mating interaction that causes this process of where the virgin Egypti females, when they mate with the Albopictus males, about one to two percent of those couplings, she ended up sterilized. And so one to two percent, that doesn't seem like much, but over time, those, that steady pressure of that continuing to happen over time displaced those populations. So it, it doesn't take it doesn't take much as far, it's like compound interest, right? You just, you let it build over time and it, it can have an effect and does. Now, this is a regional effect. Both of these mosquitoes are in the same subfamily, Stegomyia. And so this effect doesn't necessarily happen in their native ranges that this seemed to have happened in the Southeastern US and Puerto Rico. And so I think the take home message though is, is it's a molecular, you know, it's a, it's a mechanism. There is a mechanism going on. And so those are the kind of avenues that we should perhaps be exploring at a, at a much greater rate. Um, and all of that happens through an understanding of mosquito ecology. And so it's on understanding that ecology and behavior, what are the behaviors of the pests of interest that are gonna lead us to some of these answers. So it's not just about heavy duty treatments, spray treatments, we have to broaden our use of other technologies, and I, I believe, in order to get this under control. And a lot of it's about public health. Um, you know, public health is a real challenge. You know, if it's successful, 
it's under the radar and people don't recognize that those things are going on. Kind of like surveillance, right? The mosquito surveillance. Most folks don't know that, that those efforts are happening. It's only about the spray truck. That's what they see. But it's that's a deep layer cake that goes on well before they ever see the, the spray truck. So these are the things we should be, be mindful of in my, my estimation. And to come to a conclusion, I just like to reflect on that we uh, lost a real entomological uh, ambassador at the very end of 2021, Edward Wilson. Uh, he was a biologist, naturalist. He, uh, by trade, he was a entomologist and specialized in ants. So a myrmecologist is one who studies ants. But he was a real ambassador for uh, ecological stewardship and um, he lived a long, fruitful life and um, spent some of his time in Mobile, Alabama, which is uh, just 50 miles from where I grew up. So he was always on my radar as I was growing up. And I would just like to impress upon everyone that mosquitoes are fascinating and that uh, I'll spread the word. So with that, I thank you for the time here and um, thank the Mosquito Habitat Mapper for uh, uh, working with us in our TREAD program to help reduce uh, mosquito pressures through tire removals. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dan. This has been just so, so interesting. And your your slant is a little bit different than any other talk we've had before, because you are actually in operational mosquito management. Most of the people we have had talk in our series are people that are really on more on that research end. So um, I think that your presentation really more as much as any other has demonstrated the, you know, the critical importance of, of surveillance to, to human health. And one of the questions that came, came through in the chat um, was uh, by Lisa. And Lisa asked, you know, as we're moving you know, towards mosquito season, what measures are being taken to address st standing ponds of water, um, the TREAD program, how do you connect with human, um, health and human services? And what's the problem with uh, West Nile, Zika, encephalitis? So we need to have you come and talk for another three times to address all of her questions. But, you know, what, you know, give us a little bit of an idea of the scale of the problem um, that we have in contrast to how much, you know, resources, human resources and financial resources we have to actually do the control that we need to protect ourselves from disease. So at least I'm changing your question just a little bit so he can actually answer it. <laughs> no, that, that, that's good. Um, so oftentimes um, mosquito control districts are, aren't well funded. And so they, they've got a limited number of personnel to do the work. Um, but I, having worked with public health folks, I, I see the efforts that goes on and it, it, they can get a remarkable amount of work done on the surveillance side of things and they know what needs to be done, oftentimes they're limited on treatments. Um, as we've seen, uh, the, the environmental regulations on what can be done um, has become more restrictive, and, I'll, and I'm all for that. We, we have to be mindful of how we put our products out. Um, most up-close mosquito management problems are, are human-driven. You know, we, we're just not policing up the properties that, that promote mosquito issues, container mosquitoes uh, for West Nile or, excuse me, excuse me, for a yellow fever with Aedes aegypti. They, they, we have vaccines now, so the technology is there to help us. Um, but we're still not cleaning up in, in a real way some of our properties. So we, you get a lot of nuisance calls that then require treatment that some of those nuisance calls could be reduced in a real way just by being more mindful of property management. That's a dragged out answer. I'm sorry. Hopefully that was, I hit enough points. That's, yeah, that's the, I think that is, um, yeah, all, all you can do. We're all so limited, but that's, that, that is fantastic. And I think that the understanding that we're getting of where we're finding the mosquitoes and where the habitats are 
um, is going to significantly contribute to our ability to, you know, so sort of take the limited resources we have and apply them effectively, right? That's kind of what you're you're doing with this. Um, why don't you say a few words here? Um, we're going to finish up pretty soon, but if you just take one or two minutes talking about, we're going to be uh, talking about the spare tire challenge in just a minute. Yeah, um, sure. But uh, why, why, why did you get so interested in tires, Dan? <laughs> okay. So funny enough, um, I, re I recognized, so I, I love collecting mosquitoes anyways. So that's a, uh, it's gone past the hobby. I would call it an avocation at this point. But uh, I, I noticed that I, I collect quite a few talks from tires. And so I was initially trying, before I had the colony, I was trying to collect enough wild talks to develop my own colony before I met Anita Schiller and she was able to help me out. But all the same, I still collect for those talks. But um, I, over time, I recognized like we, we just, I, I'm seeing a lot of tires here. There's too many. That's a problem. And for the most part, it's not talks that are in there, but other mosquitoes, namely Albopictus and other challenging uh, mosquitoes. So uh, it's like, what can we do to start reducing this tire issue? And so, I, and, and then I started looking into why do we have a tire issue? And so that, that's what we kind of got to get to. When we have a problem. We have to understand. Why is it a problem to begin with? It's not just lazy people. It's the tires are persistent. We go through a lot of them, right? And so they, they can't be landfilled in a real way. So 33 states in the U.S. don't allow for solid tire or full tire landfilling. They have to be managed in some way in order to even be landfilled. So that, that's labor intensive, energy intensive. Uh, and so my thought was, let's, Let's look, firstly, let's locate the tires. Let's see exactly what kind of mosquitoes are developing in those tires. Uh, how much are they holding as far as water goes? And so we can we can tabulate that and get some some metrics as to how much tires are promoting mosquito populations. And then figure out ways to alter those tires so that they're no longer a mosquito hazard. And then uh, ways of disposal and, and or to me more importantly, avenues for recycle, more so than disposal. But uh, mm -hmm. that, that's that's the onus behind it. That's super wonderful. Thank you so much, Dan. And I think that uh, we might have a couple more minutes to talk to ask more questions. If you have questions, please put them in the chat. And I think Cassie now is going to talk a little bit about the spare tire blitz that we're that we are um, going, we're kicking off essentially today. So uh, do you want to talk a little bit about that, Cassie? Please. Sure, Rusty. Um, from starting today through June, so we'll have three months or so to make our observations. But if you could use the Globe Observer Mosquito Habitat Mapper tool um, to document places where you would or find tires. It could be a tire swing. It could be a tire that is emerging after being thrown in a moving body of water that through drought conditions might not have water in it anymore. It could be tires around your property that you, we don't even really notice them. It could be in an urban setting or it could be in a, in a rural setting, but places where you would find water and tires. Um, and if possible, after you've made your observation, um, taking a photograph, if you find any larvae in the tire um, to dump the water, take a picture of the habitat, and if possible, to recycle the tire. Um, and the tire recycling can be done in, in a few ways, and I think Dan could probably help me with more than my, my one recycling plan is to just cut the sidewalls off so that there's not so many places for the water to pool up. Are there other ways that you could suggest, Dan? Uh yeah, some people just drill holes in it, uh, so the the tires are pretty resilient, and um, it takes a little. It takes a good bit of effort to cut them. Um, so I've I've got a little machine that I'm mounting mm -hmm. on a little trailer for collecting and, and altering those tires. But uh, even even just drilling holes in the sidewall where the steel belts aren't um, right. will we'll help will help that in a real way. I, I know that there's recycling where I live in South Dakota that will actually shred the tires so that you can use them around your house for weed yes. control, but whatever you can do to, you know, recycling the tire. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Part of this is 
um, the, the the idea behind tread is to also recognize what each county does. I'm starting in Florida. What what, what are their tire management policies? And some mosquito control districts do have policies where they'll accept tires as well. So just an FYI for our globe community, um, I've created a, a, a team, Spare Tire Blitz, um, and you can join our team. And if you're a member of another team, that's okay. You can be members of lots of teams, but the code that we were um, provided when I created the team is shown here on the slide. And if you're not sure how to join a team, after you've launched the app up here in the gear icon, you'll see a screen and you just kind of scroll down through the screen until you see the join a globe team. And then you can type in our code to join the team. So what we'll end up getting as a community will be a, I'm hoping for a whole host of photographs with water where you might find mosquito larvae and the habitats around it. And at the conclusion of our, our blitz, we will, um, help you by cleaning up the data and making it available so that you would have some pre-packaged data sets that you could use with your students to go a little bit deeper and ask some questions from comments that or to the presentation that Dan's made who, to make an IVSS submission for a project. We have a kind of a, a one pager posted on the Mission Mosquito webpage but again, just as a reminder, between today and the end of June, you can join Globe Spare Tire Blitz team with this referral code. If you want to share the code with friends and family, please do that. But we want to, we want to find tires. They could be around a building. It could be out in a rural setting. On this image, you'll find a tire swing. And as Dan mentioned, after you've made your observations, if it's your tire swing, you could put holes on the bottom so it doesn't collect water. But if it's not your area and not your property, please ask permission before you do any observations. Rusty, is there anything else that I've missed on that one? Oh, I think, no, I think that's absolutely perfect. And uh, I actually went into the GLOBE database and I made a map of all the places where we have found tires so far. And um, I'm going to be sharing that in a in, in the next blog. Dan and I are going to do a, a blog for um, uh, NASA Globe Observer Social Media. Mm -hmm. And so that map will be in there. But we do have already, you know, hundreds of observations of mosquitoes, uh, mosquito larvae that have been found in tires. Um, a very, very exciting find um, is uh, was in Madagascar, where we found a um, Anopheles mosquito in a tire. And this is very unusual because Anopheles mosquitoes in Africa are not uh, container species. They are, in fact, um, they utilize natural standing water habitats. So um, working with our AI friends um, at the University of South Florida, they ran AI over one of the um, pictures, one of the images submitted by one of you guys from Madagascar. And lo and behold, they, they have identified this as a Anopheles stephensi, which is a invasive mosquito um, that is causing a new health problem in Africa because it's um, like, like 80s mosquitoes, they are daytime biters. So the whole bed net uh, phenomenon, which is supporting health against malaria, isn't going to be of use against this species that also can carry the plasmodium um, uh, parasite. So anyway, um, you know, we, this, this find that we have found that has been identified using the AI, what we need to do is we need to reach back to our citizen scientists in, Mal in uh, Madagascar and see if we can get a live specimen so we can get the DNA, so we can do the PCR analysis to confirm this, um, this. But this is the kind of research that all of you are contributing to right now. And um, I, 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 I can't, I can't uh, stress how important this one find was um, to, um, you know, to, to our, to the global health work, you know, the president's malaria initiative is extremely excited about this find. And, um, you know, they have actually distributed uh, the clip on microscopes to scientists in, um, in Mauritius and in Ethiopia. 
um, to see if we can corroborate this kind of find in other places. So um, gosh, you guys, you know, the, the container breeding places is becoming extremely important, um, you know, in terms of world health, you know, it, it looks like the Mosquito Habitat Mapper Project um, or the app used in the Globe Observer uh, part of the GLOBE program, to say it more effectively, um, seems to, you know, definitely has the potential to make a huge contribution and may have just made a huge contribution. So we are very, very excited about, uh, about this. And I can't stress how important tires are as, 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 a, as, a, uh, as a site, because that's where we found this Anopheli mosquito in Madagascar. So uh, Dan, wow, what a great talk. This is really cool. Are there any other questions um, before he goes? We've got another three minutes. Let me jump on with that, Rusty, because I know that our group really enjoys the challenge. And here's our challenge besides joining our spare tire blitz, what we'd like to have from every, oops, from everyone is we want to make you the focus of our webinar next month. And so to do that, what we need from you are your photographs and your stories and, and a little bit of information about you. So if you could submit them to me and my email has been on the webinar announcements and everything, but I'll share it again. Um, we'd like you to tell us about the discarded tire problem in your community, if there is one or if there isn't, and how many tires did you document? Um, did they have any mosquito larvae in them? And then the photos or the video of you actually collecting the data would be wonderful. If you could send that to us, we'd like to feature you for you to tell us the sto your story at our next webinar. So if you could do that for us, we would really appreciate it. And we'd like the information by April 13th, if possible. While you're thinking of your last minute questions, um, April 21st will be our spare tire blitz around the world, which is for you. And then if any of you are educators attending the NSTA in Houston, March 30th to April 3rd, uh, Liz Burke and I have a presentation on March 31st from 8 a.m. to 9, and we'd love to meet up with you. This is really exciting. Thank you, uh, Cassie. And um, Dan, I know you're going to be excited also. We'll have you also take a look at the uh, um, at the reports out by our community. And um, so I'm, we're going to invite you also to attend this if you can, so you can see what, you know, what this talk and what this, uh, this bio blitz that we're doing, what the outcomes are around the world. Because we have people today in, in Africa, in Brazil that are listening to this talk. So it's not just the U.S. here. This is a problem which is worldwide, as we know. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I'd, I'd love to participate. Thank you for inviting me. Again, if there are any, any other questions for Dan, Dan, we're so happy that you took time today to share everything, including your sense of humor, because oh, thank you. <laughs> and, your, and your science fiction, you know, it's like the aha gotcha moment on, on the video of Great. Jurassic Park. Thank you for sharing all of your insights. And I can't, I can't wait to have you talk with our group again. So thank you so much. Wonderful. I'd love to do it again. And it's a, it's a lot of fun. So it doesn't have to all be stuffy, right? We can. <laughs> As you demonstrated with uh, Elvis Presley and Jurassic Park and Friends. Uh, you know, all yeah. this uh, I'm an Elvis yeah. fan, for, but uh, it's just uh, <laughs> I thought it was worth sharing. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you everyone for attending. Uh, uh, Cassie and I and Dan and the rest of our team are really looking forward to seeing your videos, your photos. We'll be looking for your, um, your uploads to the Mosquito Habitat Mapper. And um, it, it will be coming together in about five weeks. And uh, hopefully we'll have some good reports out. So see you then. <laughs>